Hello. So in this video, I'm going to talk about the stress strain curve. Uh, a stress strain curve is a, a common tool that we would use to better understand material properties for um, a variety of materials, primarily in the in the metal family. But um, it's a useful tool in that it allows us to you know take experimental data and visualize it and kind of understand what's going on. So a stress strain curve would be developed typically using a tensile test machine. Um, by measuring the load that we apply to a test specimen and then uh, the deflection that it undergoes. So this, this uh, process then pro produces load deflection data, which we can then uh, turn into um, turn into uh, other data like stress and strain if we know the initial condition. So if we know the um, area cross-sectional area of the test specimen and the initial gauge length we can you know use that to get uh, more information about the curve or about the stress and the strain so i'm going to go ahead and, and bring up my notes and i have already uh, pasted in here an image of a of a s example um, curve uh, probably for a ductile material just based on on what it looks like so Typically, or some of the typical features that we would expect to find are this, um, you know, linear elastic region where the, the, the stress increases uh, at a constant rate as strain increases, uh, a yielding phase, so where we see the yield uh, behavior happening, some strain hardening where the stress continues to, to increase, some peak. And then we have necking, and this is, you know, if you're testing a ductile material, you, you see that necking behavior where the material starts to thin down until it eventually breaks. So there's a lot of useful uh, things that we can get from here um, as we, we find, you know, the information that we need for our analysis. So typically we might pull from this, you know, point, this max point, the uh, ultimate stress. Um, of course, we might find... Uh, another common property that we want is the yield stress, uh, which we can pull off of there. And that's all great. Also, as I'm sure you're familiar with, the, the elastic modulus or the Young's modulus or the modulus of elasticity, uh, whichever word you want to use, we can pull from the slope of this uh, linear elastic region of the curve. And we take, you know, the rise over run of that uh, in order to give us stress over strain and we typically call that E for that elastic modulus uh, and again that's that's a useful tool for us um, so again this this material is is just kind of an ex or this excuse me curve is just kind of an example curve for you know a ductile material of course they don't all look exactly like this um, sometimes we might see um, we might see curves that, if I can get a different color up here, we might see curves that, you know, after this linear elastic region, they kind of, instead of having this, you know, st steep bend, they might just kind of curve over like this until there's a fracture. Um, you know, that might be, be more common of like an aluminum alloy or something like that compared to a steel um, or like a low carbon steel. And, you know, it's not always easy to see where that, that yield point begins to occur. Of course, you know, looking at this curve, we can see, okay, it's straight, 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 and then eventually it, it begins to, to curve over. And that might give us some information. Uh, one thing that we might uh, use, and, and one kind of standard for finding the yield in that, in that situation, we might use what's called the 0.2% the offset. So basically what that means is if we come down here to this bottom corner, we find where the strain is 0.2 percent so you know i've probably exaggerated here it's probably much closer to um to our line but if we take this and we we go up from there well well i can't draw a straight line to save myself but um, if we go up from there uh, and find where that crosses then we might say okay that's the yield uh, stress based on based on this 0.2% um, offset method, where the slope of this offset line has the same 
uh, slope as our linear elastic region just offset by that 0.2% of strain. Um, so that's, that's a way that we might find that. And then again, we call this region the linear elastic region, basically up until we start to see yielding. Um, that's what we look for there. Um, ductile failures, uh, and, and the reason we see necking like this, generally due to uh, dislocation of the molecules. So if I have my you know, tensile specimen and I'm applying a load to it, uh, what I'm really seeing is some dislocation plane uh, typically pretty close to a 45 degree angle and I might see slippage of my molecules along that plane so if I you know kind of zoomed in I'm gonna draw some some molecules on here shade one of them to highlight it that's why it doesn't look um, do something like this I have these molecules and if I get a dislocation basically what's happening is say this top row moves over until those two dark ones, uh, do sh two shaded ones are aligned, and eventually until that molecule is slipped past the other one, and it's, it's, a, it's a dislocation of the molecule, so they slip relative to each other, or move over a, a jump, and, and that eventually causes that necking, and that, you know, tend to be that, um, conical shaped failure so when you have a ductile material and you pull it in tension it fails along that 45 degree angle and we can see that when we you know closely inspect um, the tensile specimen now if i compare that uh, all of this to to what i might expect for a brittle material for a brittle material i'm going to get much more of a um, much more of a, a sharper line gosh a sharper line and Maybe it fails like that with very little um, in, in the way of strain, much less strain than we might see with stress. And actually, if I was drawing this accurately, I'd probably go much higher on the stress because brittle materials tend to have a um, higher stress capacity while having a much lower strain capacity. And so typically this, this ultimate strength of a brittle material is, is kind of the, the main thing that we need to consider. And when I'm looking at a brittle material, loading it under stress, uh, I'm not going to get that 45 degree slip. I'm going to get more of a fracture, which is right across uh, the middle, um, parallel, I guess, or excuse me, perpendicular to the direction of uh, the load being applied. And in that case, my molecules that I'm, that I'm looking at, instead of slipping along that 45 degree, they're really just separating and kind of, you know, cracking. Uh, uh, across that so it's it's a it's a higher stress because the force is required to separate those molecules uh, would be higher than than just to cause them to slip from one to the other um, you have to break those molecular forces in order to get that that failure to occur now if I uh, look at an, another chart which I'll put up here in a second We can get some interesting information from uh, these these charts too. So again, I've just got a slightly different version of this here, a much simpler version, uh, which shows a brittle versus a ductile material. And the key point I want to make here is that this area under the curve equals absorbed energy. So that's uh, something we call toughness. It's the ability of the material to absorb energy. So as I deform it, as I you know take a hammer to it, whatever I'm doing, I'm you know, causing all sorts of strain uh, and dislocations within the mo molecules, which is basically energy that gets stored um, in the material. And ductile materials are much tougher, which, you know, we might expect. We can smash things that are ductile, like steel things with a hammer, um, and not expect them to break much more uh, readily than we would, you know, smash a brittle material like glass and, you know, expect it to be able to absorb that. So um, we can see that when we look at this uh, the strain energy or this, this area under the curve. It, and, and it's the energy that the uh, material is willing to, to accept before it uh, eventually fails. And um, mostly uh, the things that we want to consider are, or keep in mind, are, are all of these different quantities that we can pull off from here. Um, I do want to just, while I have this picture up, mention again, you know, we have what we consider the elastic region, which is everything to the right, 
and then we have the plastic region which is everything to the left and basically what we're seeing is uh, which deformations can be recovered versus which ones can't so I'm talking specifically about ductile materials here when we say something has uh, elastic deformation basically what we're saying is we expect that that uh, deformation can be recovered so if I release the load it'll go back to its original shape once I've plastically deformed something then we say that 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 deformation isn't going to be recovered right if I release my my the load that I've applied to it some of the uh, the shape will be recovered but not all of it right and we can actually kind of see that like if I uh, am traveling along this curve as I apply greater and greater load to my part we could actually say let's stop here and go back on a line that's you know if I could draw a parallel would be parallel to this linear elastic region and this this area here is basically the the elastic recovery so that's deformation that gets recovered when the load is removed uh, but all of this uh, this deformation down here that isn't recovered that's that's the plastic deformation so that's the the deformation that isn't going to uh, be recovered now when we're designing something you know we can take both of these things into account and it really depends on the application in terms of what matters right sometimes uh, or many times our applications require that nothing yields right so we don't uh, observe any plastic deformation and that's you know critical for a lot of things right things we don't want to permanently deform and not go back to their original shape uh, however there are also uh, applications where plastic deformation is okay as long as it doesn't break right you know um, you could think of like uh, safety features you know if I have a, a one-time use you know pin on a on a roller coaster and it's intended to take a certain amount of load and you know not uh, uh, not fail it's like a, a last-ditch safety effort or something like that maybe an emergency break it's perfectly fine if it gets plastically deformed because as soon as it's used it's gonna be thrown out and replaced uh, but we don't want it to break obviously you know because uh, say it's you know this emergency break if it fails then then we have bigger problems so we might you know consider all those different things and of course deformation in, in and of itself might be a failure we might not even be all that concerned about stress we might be concerned about how much something deforms so if, if I have two gears that are meshing and they're mounted on a shaft and uh, or on shafts and one of those shafts deforms too much and it brings the gears out of mesh well that might be a problem right for my application so sometimes deformation is the thing that we have to worry about and all of these things you know are some things uh, things that we might want to consider so uh that kind of gives my my broad overview of you know what we're looking at when we look at a stress strain curve um, we're going to get into stress uh here shortly uh in the next video and then we're going to start talking about you know once we know a stress what what is what is it that causes failure or how do we know when that stress causes failure um so yeah i, I think that covers what i wanted to cover today all right thank you very much